Okay, Scott, I'm just gonna un I'm gonna unmute myself. We're I think we're on air. Hello. <laughs> this is very hard because I'm not getting feedback right now. Okay, so it sounds like we do actually, we are actually live. <laughs> a little bit of a technical snafu there. That's what happens when you try to get lots of amazing people together. So while we're warming up, welcome to the launch for Asteroid Day 2018. We're having people from all over the world dialing in, experts in asteroids, and we will be taking questions on via Twitter using the hashtag Asteroid Day 2018. And uh, Greg, who you can see right now, will be monitoring. And at the end of the Hangout, we'll answer all these questions. And uh, reporters can also send questions to pr at asteroidday.org. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to be hosting. I've been involved in Asteroid Day for a long time, I guess, because I I kind of grew up with stories of spaceships and asteroids when I studied astronomy. Uh, and, you know, I realized that some of these stories with asteroids were science fiction rather than science fact. And, uh, sorry, science fact rather than science fiction. <laughs> and, uh, you know, asteroids represent a risk and an opportunity. And it's something that I believe humanity should embrace. Uh, sorry, I'm being told. Yeah, let's just, I'm being told yeah, all that I'm the one presenting. That's not right. So let me, I'm yes. going to turn my camera off. We are having some technical issues still showing Greg. Greg, sorry. <laughs> Not Greg. He, um, uh, I get one na name mispronunciation allowed. <laughs> All right. Is this, are you, you should be technically on now. Uh, I am uh, not sure. Maybe it's because I am set up as a presenter I'm supposed to control. I think, I think you should be on. Can I, I am not, it's very hard because there is a short delay and thankfully, we know more about asteroids than we do about Google <laughs> Hangouts. This and that's very... why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very strange. So it says you're presenting. Yes, but it doesn't mean my camera is live, apparently. OK, well, it should be. Uh, let's see. OK, that is funny. I love that. I would... uh... <laughs> Greg, in case you didn't know, is also a filmmaker and therefore should be an expert in such video systems. That's Thank why we let him know. organize this. <laughs> well, on my end, you're on. So let's see. Uh, oh, this may be the moment. The problem <laughs> we have is that I actually see a bit of a, I'm seeing a delayed version to the world. And this is why we're having some. <laughs> Problem starting with this, and I'm familiar with this because, of course, I do a lot of live streaming on the internet. But uh, yeah, still looking dead to me. Okay, well, on my end, you're on, but uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, I see you again. Okay, well, I turn my camera on. That's very strange because on my end, everything says you're on. Hmm. Uh, what kinds of large audio? Well, well, I mean, I can hear everyone. You know what? I think. No. Okay. We'll give this another. I mean, you know, people are logging in right now, anyway. So. Yes, we're hoping that people are still tuning in and and are about to, are, are basically waiting for the best. We're saving the best for last. Um, yeah, you know, all I'm seeing is is Greg just kind of looking at the screen and in front of a, a wonderful board showing basically everyone that is supporting Asteroid Day. ESA, B612, SES, uh, Cisco. And now I've realized I'm supposed to know everyone, right? It's probably a bad PR move.
Okay. Maybe maybe if I, I maybe I have to click everyone because it looks like um, let's try this. And also, by the way, nobody can hear you, Greg. I just want to test oh, yeah, to see if I, 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 was muted. I go oh. live. Okay, people might feel more comfortable if the person on the screen was the one speaking. Okay, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> so, so now I am. But I think I think if I click on you, you should be visible. So let's let's give this a second because there's a delay on the YouTube feed, anyways. So let's see. See if I click on Mark. I think people should be able to see Mark. It's usually the way uh, it works. YouTube is still delayed. Yeah. No, so I have not, <laughs> I've yet to see myself on the screen. So we'll see <sighs> if I click on Mark, people can see Mark. Are you sure you're not some kind of like in your control, you're like the presenter or something like that? Uh, I'm still, it looks Greg, like I'm the presenter. I can try click Greg, on other people. It seems like That's, whoever's talking, okay. the image goes to oh, them. I, so weird, this whole thing is. Yeah, I think you should set yourself to be the presenter. Present to everyone and then, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm presenting to everyone, but then people would be seeing me, that's kind of but strange. Can you click on the portraits at the bottom? Yeah, I, I, I've been doing that. <laughs> I think, I think, I think oh. we almost got it. Let's see if we're getting it now. There's a delay on the YouTube anyway, so let's see. Can we see Scott? Scott, where are you? Are you still in the stars? I am still in the stars, I think. No, I'm not seeing anything coming through YouTube. <laughs> Technical uh, issues, yes, people all over the world are seeing that. I assure you that we are actually, we do actually know our stuff about asteroids, and this is merely technical issues with figuring out how Google Hangouts work. Uh, not, not to say that Google Hangouts is bad, it's just, um, it's not our area of expertise. Okay, so if I go on Danica, you should be able to see Danica, right? Maybe. You are, Danica. you're hosting the whole thing, right? No, not anymore. But it's hosted via YouTube. Yeah, so if I'm saying Danica is presenting to everyone. And on my YouTube end, it says Danica is presenting. But that may not be the same as showing the screen. But I've also got her selected. <laughs> it's actually quite funny. Yes, right. it is. <laughs> I'll oh, straight I see day you. Kick off. No, wait, I clicked on Danica. And it does look like it's changing here. But yeah, it is changing here. I just don't know what the delay is on, on the YouTube end. It's typically Welcome about the 20 Astro seconds. Yeah. 20 seconds, wow. Oh, okay. We're working on our presentation console. Welcome to Astro Day press conference kickoff. <laughs> see, I can see Danica on my end, so. Thank you to everyone who's on the channel right now. We're still working behind the scenes to get this to work. Okay, I'm going to eject myself, and then technically, Scott, are you able to take over then? I, I'm not like, sure I'm ready I, for that responsibility. <laughs> I've been doing this many times, and it's the very first time this is happening. This is so strange. I still can't figure out why. Um, Anybody have a genius idea that I'm not seeing? I'm literally clicking everything here. Um, Actually, I'm sharing, controls. I'm sharing controls with you. So maybe see if you can take over. Uh, control room. Uh, now I can't see the chat. Uh, OK, let's see. Let's try clicking on me. Yeah, that doesn't seem to do anything. Yeah, I mean, usually this does not happen, so it must be something here within the Hangout. We think we've got a broken Hangout, is that what we're saying? Well, 
I've been doing this so often and this never happened. So I'm doing exactly everything that I usually do. And this is, yeah, I don't know. Are we letting our viewers know that we're running a little bit behind schedule? Due uh, to this is actually live, Danica. This is okay, live. great. Live. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. I mean, I don't know. I, I've shared my controls with you, Scott. So if I no, have clicked myself, through the various controls and nothing seems to, to work. It is very strange. <laughs> I guess if I can I Yeah. Yeah, see, because you turned me off now. Well, I thought that yeah, I'm just trying to turn I see that works, but selecting various people does not seem to promote them. Okay, so so Diana's oh. saying Diana's saying that uh Although people can't hear us, uh, can't see us, they can hear us. So maybe we just do uh, um, audio only. And I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and so that people can actually. Well, that would be one see. way to do it. OK. Yeah. Yeah. OK. I'm just going to, I don't know what's happening. All right. So I'm going to click on Scott. And technically, people should see and hear you now. Okay, well, let's see if this actually works. <laughs> Apologies for these terrible technical issues. I mean, I, I've obviously had issues with streaming in the past, but it looks like we've had to jury rig a solution. But uh, thankfully, the asteroid uh, is something that we're a little more expert on. And well, welcome to the Asteroid Day 2018 launch stream, where we have a lot of experts in asteroids rather than streaming. So first of all, first up, we would like anyone that wants to ask a question, you can submit the question via Twitter using the hashtag Asteroid Day 2018. Now, Greg, our host, will be monitoring, and at the end of the Hangout, we will answer as many of the questions as possible. If you're a reporter, you may also send a question to pr at asteroidday.org. Now, I'm very excited to be hosting this amazing panel. I've been involved with an asteroid day because I kind of grew up with stories of space and spaceships. And when I went on to study astronomy, I realized that many of those stories with, with asteroids weren't just science fiction, they were science fact. Asteroids represent a real risk and an opportunity. And it's something I believe that humanity should embrace. So going on, thanks to the regional coordinators for last year, where we had 200 countries, over 1,300 independently organized Asteroid Day events. Uh, they took place with half a million people participating all over the world. Millions of people participated on June 30th online, and we hope that we'll host an event this year on or around June 30th. Just join Asteroid Day for more details. Now, our panel today consists of uh, experts who are dialing in from all over the world. Uh, let me see, we have uh, Ed Liu and Danica Remy, who are all actually in the Bay Area with me. Uh, Greg is in Europe right now, Debbie Lewis in the UK, Tom Jones, astronaut, Mark Boslow, Ian Carnelli, and Rudiger Yen in uh, Europe. But right now, we're going to go over to Greg Richters, who you've already seen. He is a co-founder of Asteroid Day, along with Dr. Brian May, Rusty Schwickert, and Danica Remy. Over to you, Greg. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Let's see. Actually, I think this actually worked. That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for hosting this, Scott. Sorry, everybody, for, uh, for all that uh, t technical thing. I'll put that on my, that's my fault. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so last year, um, many of you probably watched uh, our broadcast. Uh, for the very first time, we did a 24-hour live broadcast from Luxembourg, uh, Astro Day Live from Luxembourg. And it was the very first 24-hour broadcast um, that was only dedicated to space and asteroids. And uh, we had uh, most of the major space agencies involved, many different partners were delivering wonderful content. And uh, one of the main broadcasts uh, took place right here from Luxembourg. Uh, from RTL City, and uh, we actually had our own dedicated TV channel. And so this year, we're basically doing that again, but bigger, better, even wider reach. And instead of doing 24 hours, we actually have our very own TV channel, Astro Day TV, for 30 days, the entire month of June. And then from June 29th until July 1st, 
uh, we have a live broadcast. So we'll again come from uh, Luxembourg. Uh, Brian Cox is coming back as our host uh, with astronauts, uh, astronaut experts, scientists, policymakers, and some special guests. And we'll be announcing that program uh, very soon. So thanks to um, our wonderful partners, sponsors, all the coordinators, everybody who's um, you know helping us make Astrid such a wonderful success worldwide. Um, you know we're going to be rocking this year again, and uh, stay tuned for uh, some amazing updates. So I'm giving it back to Scott. Uh, just give me. Oh, thanks, thanks, Greg. We uh, look forward to your. Well, we we'll look forward to. <laughs> The TV broadcast this year, and uh, we hope that we'll go off a little better than this one. So yeah, and the next guest we have is Dana Karimi. She is a uh, Asteroid Day co-founder, and she is, of course, coming to me for, to us from a little distance away. <laughs> Danica, thanks, Scott. Um, I want to echo how much we appreciate the leaders of the thousands of independently organized Asteroid Day events around the world. Each of these regional coordinators and local event organizers make Asteroid Day real. <clears throat> this year will be our second year as the official United Nations Asteroid Day. Thanks to the leadership of our Asteroid Day ambassador, Doran Pernario, and the work of the Association of Space Explorers, they laid the groundwork for Asteroid Day to be swiftly recognized by the United Nations. And last year, Asteroid Day became a Luxembourg-based charity and is now a program of the new Asteroid Foundation. The Asteroid Day founders would really like to thank Luxembourg for their leadership in supporting Asteroid Day. We received a tremendous amount of support from Deputy Prime Minister Etienne Snyder and the Ministry of Economy and Space Resources.LU staff. We're also grateful to George Schmidt, who now serves as our board chair, and Guy Harless, who serves as our vice chair, along with Doran Pinario, who serves on the board of directors, along with myself and Greg. Asteroid Day's move to Luxembourg would not have been possible without the major sponsors and partners who, who helped make Asteroid Day Live from Luxembourg a global success. These sponsors last year included SES, RTL, the Broadcasting Center of Europe, OHB, BIL, the Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce, and B612 Foundation, among many others. Central to Asteroid Day is the 100X Declaration, which was co-written by Tom Jones, Mark Boslow, Rusty Schweikart, and Ed Liu. Over 5,000 private, 50,000 private citizens around the world have signed it. The declaration is a call to action to accelerate the rate of discovery and deepen our knowledge of asteroids. We have over 200 notable entertainers, scientists, business leaders who have endorsed the 100X declaration. And we'd like to welcome some of our most recent signatories, Jack Black, Ron Howard, Sarah Brightman, Whoopi Goldberg, and John Carter to the list. We're delighted to add these luminaries among thousands of new ones to our list of citizens around the world who are calling upon humanity to accelerate the rate of discovery and deepen our knowledge of asteroids. Back to you, Scott. Thank you, Danica. It's great to hear the progress that's happening. So yeah, um, as we heard, the world of the asteroids has expanded. We've got new sponsors, new supporters all over the world, people at all levels. But uh, yeah, we're gonna go hopefully to another scientist, uh, another astronaut now. We have Dr. Tom Jones, who was a US astronaut with NASA. He flew on four different space missions and he will be dialing in from his car and I don't know whether he's ready yet because we've had some issues with the feedback. So we should probably just, I might have to fill some air time. Because <laughs> uh, the, pro, well, yes. Oh, Tom is ready. We, Tom is ready. Okay, well, let's go over to Tom. Okay. Well, hello, everybody, and thanks for inviting me to the uh, Asteroid Day Hangout today. I'm uh, Tom Jones from the Association of Space Explorers. I'm the uh, chairman of their Near Earth Objects Committee, and I guess my reminiscence of the uh, Chelyabinsk impact uh, five years ago was pretty special. I was in Vienna at, at, at a United Nations session focused on the hazard from near Earth asteroid impacts, and so we woke up to go to the session that day at the United Nations in Vienna, and we found out that that morning, several time zones to the east of us in Russia, there had been this impact of a small asteroid over the city of Chelyabinsk in the Ural Mountains. 
So by the time we got to the UN session, we had actually had some images come in over the internet that we could actually show the United Nations uh, delegates about this small impact over a city in the Urals. You know, sent a thousand people to the hospital from blast damage caused by the 450 kiloton equivalent explosion of this 20 meter object over the, the city in Chelyabinsk. So the danger there was that that impact could have been much more deadly had the object penetrated the Earth's atmosphere at a steeper angle or coming with greater velocity in its orbit around the sun, we could have had much more blast damage and injuries or deaths in the population below. And I guess that uh, impact that morning with the timing fortuitous coinciding with the UN session reminded us of the millions of asteroids that orbit the sun that could cause damage to the Earth on a citywide scale. And if we don't have information about their orbital elements, their orbital positions around the sun, uh, we can't really do anything to protect the Earth. So it's, it's imperative that we, working through the United Nations, working internationally, map these orbits of these objects to protect the Earth. So I think that morning, the delegates at the United Nations were just stunned by the coincidence that this cosmic impact had occurred and underlined the global reach of this hazard and the global need to cooperate on finding uh, tracking, and then warning of any hazardous near-Earth objects that are headed our way. Uh, I think over the next couple of years after Chelyabinsk got the United Nations, uh, the uh, discussions there moved forward quite uh, swiftly to establishing a couple of groups, the International Asteroid Warning Network, the Space Missions Planning Advisory Group that will conduct international search, warning, and deflection planning discussions uh, in the coming years to arrive at a solar system map of these hazardous objects. and. I think it's imperative that we support those efforts to cooperate and searching for the right telescope capabilities to map the orbits of the million objects or so out there that can level a city. We were just lucky that at Chelyabinsk, uh, it was a small object and it wasn't coming in fast enough or steeply enough to cause more damage. So we're um, at a position now where we can use those cooperative efforts uh, through the Association of Space Explorers, through the United Nations, through the space agencies of the world to protect the Earth from this hazard, actually prevent a future impact that could harm humanity in the future. Well, thank you, Tom. That was that was fantastic. Yeah, five years ago today, I uh, we had the Chelyabinsk impact, or it was quite a day, of course, because we'd been expecting another close approach later that day, and this was a little closer than we'd been expecting. But now we are going to go over to Debbie Lewis, who is the Deputy, Deputy Chair of Asteroid Day Expert Panel. She's a specialist in risk, crisis, and disaster management. Over to you, Debbie. Of course, events such as Chelyabinks um, serve to remind us that the hazard posed by asteroids is not limited to the larger objects. Um, it's essentially from the smaller ones that also pose a risk. And, and of course, the other aspect with smaller objects, um, there are more of them than the larger ones and they're harder to detect. And as a consequence, they can appear suddenly and without warning. So thankfully, um, events such as Chelyabinsk aren't a regular occurrence. However, due to the rarity of these events, they can subsequently be forgotten. And the lessons identified often at best overlooked or at worst ignored. Therefore, the world today is unaware of the hazard until, for the people of Chelyabinsk five years ago today, it was too late. Um, as a result, therefore, the hazard posed by the asteroid impact event needs to be explained in advance in much the same way as the risk communication for earthquakes and tsunamis, so that people are warned, informed and advised, and that they know exactly how to respond in order to avoid the injuries from flying glass, falling masonry and the small objects themselves. Now really is the time to think about closer partnership working, uh, greater partnership working between the scientific and the emergency management communities in order to be able to more fully prepare humanity for the response to when, not if, an event similar to Chelyabinsk were to occur again. And really just to reiterate what Tom was saying, you know, this is really important that, um, that international collaboration takes place globally and we have the time now, uh, hopefully, uh, before the next impact event, uh, to work together much more in a much more coordinated uh, and collaborative fashion. Um, so I really hope that um, that more people are uh, are more aware of the hazard now and start to discuss and and debate it. So 
Thank you. Back back to you, Scott. Well, thank you, Debbie. So if you're Scott, just joining... Just hold on. Sorry, just hold on one second. Sorry, I've just got to oh, make sure. We, yeah, we have a stream yep. section. Yep. Okay. Sorry. And now you should be back on because we had some technical issues with Debbie. All right. Yes, we're working our way through these technical issues today, unfortunately. We assure you that the real Asteroid Day stream will be uh, planned out a little better. <laughs> But yeah, if you're just joining us and you want to ask questions, you can actually uh, message us on Twitter with the hashtag Asteroid Day 2018. We just heard from Debbie Lewis, from the, who's on the Asteroid Day expert panel. And next, we're going to hear from Dr. Mark Boslow, who's the chair of the Asteroid Day expert panel. So over to you. My phone is oh. beeping. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, always something. So thank you, Scott. Um, I am the, now the chair of the expert panel. Um, this was set up by uh, me and Rusty Schweikart, the original chair. And, and I was very honored uh, to take over that role. Um, the purpose of the expert panel is to make so sure that, that everything that comes out of Asteroid uh, Day is actually correct the to the best of our knowledge. And, uh, um, I so I want to um, describe something. Roll. Let's let's imagine for a moment that we're driving on a motorway and, and the sun is coming up to the east and we're driving south. So we're, we're driving along and I even have a, a, a little... Uh, sun to my uh, left here and I can't see because of the glare of the sun and suddenly before I can even react a car comes from my left and, and just clips the front of my car seemingly coming from nowhere because I didn't see it that's essentially the same geometry as uh, the Chelyabinsk asteroid that appeared to come out of the sun but it didn't really come out of the sun. It was in its own orbit. The Earth is in a roughly circular orbit. Uh, the Chelyabinsk, very small Chelyabinsk asteroid was in its own orbit, a longer orbit with a period of over two years. And it came, uh, it crossed the Earth's orbit to the inside. It was to our left, if we think of uh, the direction the Earth is moving around the sun. That was the inside track and it came across and clipped us. So we were flying almost in formation. It clipped us from the left. There really was no way we could see it in the glare of the sky without a space-based telescope. Now, we could have seen it roughly six months earlier, but it was when it was at opposition, when it was directly opposite the direction of the sun in the night sky, um, but it's very, very small. So, so the point is, we need many, many more telescopes um, and a, a, at least one space-based infrared telescope that would be sensitive to very small objects and would be able to see a uh, night sky over a much larger percentage of the sky. Um, that's one way to meet uh, the asteroid declaration um, that many of us have now signed to accelerate the rate of discovery. Um, so that's one of the main purposes of Asteroid Day, and we hope you'll join us in uh, supporting that Asteroid Day declaration. Scott, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So yes, we, <laughs> we're obviously very interested in, well, we're obviously reminded five years ago by Chelyabinsk. It was a, a, an interesting moment where uh, basically everything we'd been saying happened. But um, yeah, on a, on a smaller scale, we the reverse is something that we're interested in doing. We're actually interested in going out to an asteroid and attempting to hit it with a satellite to deflect it with a space probe. And so here to talk about that is Ian Carnelli. He is a, an asteroid mission expert at the European Space Agency. And he'll be talking about um, AIM and DART. Ian. Thank you, Scott, and uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. And indeed, the type of uh, impacts we're looking at the European Space Agency is not the impact on Earth, but is uh, rather going out there into outer space and impact ourselves an asteroid. 
And uh, why do we want to do that? Uh, the reason is that we want to build an insurance policy, basically, for planet Earth. Uh, so we should not wait for the next uh, heat to get us, but we should get the technology ready to prevent that. And the best means today is what we call the kinetic impactor. This is a project we've been working on over the last 10 years uh, with our partners, our NASA and many NASA centers and laboratories uh, in the US and Europe. And we have a project ongoing called AIDA that is about uh, impacting actually um, a binary asteroid called Didymos. It's an asteroid with a little moon orbiting around it. And I'm excited to uh, recall that uh, the NASA has just released its uh, financial request for next year, and it includes uh, 150 million for planetary defense and uh, funding for this DART mission. So the, the, the spacecraft that will actually slam at about six kilometers per second into the little moon of Didymos and try to change its orbit, uh, demonstrating we can actually divert uh, an asteroid. And what we're looking at at uh, the European Space Agency is actually to uh, have a rendezvous spacecraft, so a, a spacecraft that will reach Didymos, stay there for a few months, and look at the, every little detail of this asteroid, the crater, and get all of the data we need to validate our computer models so that uh, if one day an asteroid comes towards us, we know how to design a space mission to deflect it. So uh, we reach out to all of you to get uh, support and, uh, and uh, tell your politicians how important such a project is. Uh, we have the means today uh, to deflect an asteroid, but we need to prove them. And uh, as you know, by driving your cars, you're not waiting for the accident to happen, but you you buy yourself an insurance policy before that. So that's where we're working on. Back to you, Scott. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ian. Yes, so the wonderful thing or the amazing thing about the asteroid threat, as they say, is that it's one of these threats that unlike hurricanes and other natural disasters, it's something we can actually predict years in advance. And not only that, that we can actually uh, we can actually change it. We can prevent it, and it's kind of unique in the you know disasters that are out there. But yes, before we can prevent, we have to predict, and to predict, we need to find the objects that are out there. So next up, we have Dr. Rudiger Yen from uh, ESA. He's working on the Near Earth Object Survey Team. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, I, like, I would like to describe the Flyer Telescope that the European Space Agency is building now. It's a one meter telescope and the speciality of this design is to split the overall field of view in 16 sub-field of views and to distribute the incoming light over 16 channels into state-of-the-art cameras. It's the same concept as the eye of a fly that has many facets. And with this, we achieve a field of view of 6.7 degrees by 6.7 degrees, or by 45 square degrees. So it's a really huge um, field of view. This will allow us to image almost half of the hemisphere three times per night um, at a limiting magnitude of 21.5. 21 and that corresponds to a detection of everything down to about 40 meters in diameter, um, at least three weeks before a possible impact. So we plan to have our FlyEye um, telescope deployed in the year 2019 and going full into operations in the year 2020. Um, so 40 meter objects like the Tunguska event, they are rare. So let's look at um, 10 meter objects that we expect to come about every five years and which create shockwaves, maybe not as big as the, um, Tungu uh, as the Chelyabinsk one, um, but still they can produce quite some damage. And those um, shall be reliably predicted now with our FlyEye telescope. Depending on the albedo and on the velocity, um, we would detect these 10 meter objects something like two or eight days before an impact, which gives us enough warning time for the public to tell them stay away from windows or constructions that can fall over due to shock waves. So it's exactly like a tornado warning. And um, so in 2020, we should have so some sort of asteroid weather forecast. So that's my contribution. And back to Scott. Well, thank you. I hope the weather will be clear for the foreseeable future. So yes, we've covered prediction. We've covered prediction. We've covered detection. We've covered prevention. And 
I think now it's over to our final guest, Dr. Ed Liu. He's an astronaut. He's flown on four different spacecraft, you know, the Soyuz, Shuttle, ISS, and Mir, and he is the director of the B612 Asteroid Institute. Ed. Thanks, Scott, and thanks for having, having me on uh, today. Uh, the, the Chelyabinsk incident five years ago was a, a great reminder that we are living on a rock orbiting the sun along with many other objects. Uh, there are there are millions of asteroids out there of varying sizes, more than a million of which could actually take out a city should they hit the Earth. And our job as humans, as we move out into the solar system, as as we as we spread as a species, is to figure out where all these asteroids are, where they're going, and where they're going to be. Um, I liken it to producing the first maps of an area that is a new frontier, which, is the, which space really is. And over the next few decades, as humans move outwards, uh, continue this, this process of moving outwards into our solar system and becoming players in the solar system, not just observers, uh, we'll, we'll be able to produce a map of the locations of these asteroids using the observations from the many telescopes around the world and hopefully in space uh, to produce this three-dimensional dynamic map so we can understand where everything is, where it's going, and know um, not just days before, hopefully, an asteroid hits, but years or even decades beforehand that an asteroid uh, is on a collision course with Earth so that we can do something about it. And I think we're living in a very special time because we are the really the first generations that are going to experience the transition of human beings from just being on planet Earth to be, really being citizens of the, of the solar system. So thank you, and back to you, Scott. Well, thanks, Ed. So yeah, that is being that is our list of experts, and we uh, have had well, we've had, heard a lot about the various um, the various activities that are already going on. Of course, the activity we are here to talk about is raising awareness, and that is Asteroid Day 2018. So of course, there will be events in uh, June 30th, which is of course to it's to coincide with the Tunguska event in uh, June 30th. We uh, are hoping that people from the public who are interested will help create their own event events, and you can sign up at asteroidday.org. If you just want to participate or show your support, there is, of course, the 100X Declaration, which is a uh, essentially a petition asking for governments to present their resources, to devote the resources required to discover a hundred times more small near-Earth objects than we know today. So um, with that, I guess we have a few questions the, from the internet. I've been asking questions using the hashtag AstroidDay2018. And I'm wondering who wants to answer questions here because we have one question from Glenn who is asking, what is the smallest asteroid which could threaten Earth? And do I have a volunteer here to answer these? Mark seems to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Oh, and uh, Mark is not muted. OK. We have. We are not hearing uh, Mark, unfortunately. Uh I didn't hear the question either. So the question from Glenn, uh, Mark, what is the smallest th asteroid that can be a threat that we would be considering? Well, um, so the Chelyabinsk asteroid was, we determined to be about 20 meters in diameter. Um, that's a very small asteroid. Um, there are about 10 million of those, we estimate, in Earth crossing orbits. So one of those could hit again at any time. And, and as we know, um, there were nearly uh, 1,500 people uh, that were injured by that asteroid. Uh, fortunately, no one was killed, but I think that was just pure luck um, because people were seriously injured by the blast wave. So an asteroid of this size is, is really something that we need to have advanced warning about. Um, and we estimate now that um, an asteroid of this size um, probably hits the Earth on average once every 50 years. 
Um, that's not a lot, but it was a it was a very large explosion. Even a small asteroid like that, because it's going so fast, um, it has a lot of kinetic energy. That kinetic energy gets converted to an explosion when it hits the atmosphere. And it's coming so fast that the asteroid is almost like a solid surface. surface. Um, so it hits the atmosphere, it penetrates, and it explodes very much like a nuclear explosion. And, and uh, the one five years ago today exploded um, with a yield of about a half a megaton. So that's a very large uh, equivalent of a weapon of war. And we need to take the same kind of measures um, that we would if it were a nuclear explosion. And that, that is, in, in that case, people need to be educated to take shelter if they see a bright light in the sky. But even better, uh, it would be good to have some advance warning so people can board up windows, evacuate, and so forth. Now, of course, larger uh, impactors like Tunguska would do much more damage and, and an area would have to be evacuated. And then even larger explosions can, can wipe out an entire region. So we really need to step up our uh, rate of discovery and find these things with enough advance warning to, to take measures. Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, we uh, have a few more questions, I guess, but uh, we're having some issues coordinating this. So I've pulled up a few here, and I think maybe Ed would be a good one to answer uh, the next question, which uh, Ed is, of course, working with. Uh, he's, he's head of B612 and Asteroid Institute. So Ed, what, how much warning is actually needed? How far ahead do you need to discover an object to be able to predict and subsequently prevent? Well, if you, if you want to prevent an impact, you're going to need time. And the reason for that is that if you want to send a mission out there, you, you in general can't just launch it anytime you want because the Earth may not be lined up with the orbit of the, of the offending asteroid, if you'd like. And so in general, those opportunities happen sort of on a yearly type basis or a couple of year type basis, which means that if you're going to deflect an asteroid, you really need to have made up your mind that you're going to do something about it a minimum of five years, probably closer to 10 to really have a good chance of doing this. And so the, the challenge of preventing asteroid impacts becomes one of knowing uh, a decade in advance that you've got an issue. And that's more than just observing it. That's observing it well enough so that you know the trajectory well enough that you know it's a threat. Okay. So uh, sorry, can I just uh, throw in? Because uh, just so you know, the chat is public. Um, I've got a question here from Kim, um, which is, what is a chance to detect an extrasolar object on impact course towards the Earth in time? Ooh. Anyone want to ask to answer that? <laughs> Anyone I, just I, yeah, wave? Uh, Very small. Yeah. That's uh, extrasolar. Ex extrasolar objects are, are going to be moving much faster. And that's because they'll have, they, they will have essentially fallen in towards our sun under the gravitational pull of our sun from a very much further distance. So, uh, for exa example, the extrasolar object recently discovered, the first one that we have discovered, Oumuamua, is the Hawaiian name that it's been given uh, just about uh, two months ago, uh, was moving uh, a good factor of three or four faster than a typical asteroid would be in our inner solar system. So your chances of spotting it are lower because of its greater speed, but also lower because you don't get multiple opportunities. With most asteroids that are threats, you see them many times. They're going around the sun just like we are. And you have many opportunities to see it before the actual collision. With something coming in from very, very far away, uh, you, you basically have to catch it just long, you know, just on its way in because it, it, it is not making multiple passes past the sun. And uh, that makes it quite difficult. However, there's not very many of them. You know, in all of recorded history, we've, we've discovered one of those, but we've discovered uh, you know, tens of thousands of asteroids. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah, if you can count the ones in the asteroid belt, yeah. many, even more. That's true. Okay. So, um, do yeah, we have any other? Okay, Greg? 
Yeah, the most questions here are about uh, that Hawaiian Hawaiian <laughs> cigarette asteroid. Um, there's quite it was a, a very questions. popular object. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, maybe maybe particularly uh, you know if somebody wants to add anything about that in particular. I mean, I, I was fascinated by it because back when I was doing my PhD work, I was uh, really fascinated by the fact that we had never seen interstellar objects. So finally finding this one object after a long time was very cool. But also it's worth noting that this object wasn't discovered until the very last minute because the path that it took kept it away from the sun when it was, uh, it was too far away from the sun to see <laughs> Uh, because it wasn't illuminated, and then it came kind of over the top and underneath and then straight out of the sun towards us. So we didn't really see it until very, very late. And so the amount of science that we could do on it was very, very minimal. But you know, regardless, of course, astronomers were super excited and they went out and they studied this in every single way. They came up with these really interesting looking light curves, came up with the idea that it was a long, elongated object. But yeah, I mean, these and long period comets even that are bound to the solar system are something that, while potentially a threat, they're not something that we yet can figure out how to deal with. And thankfully, the chance of these hitting is much, 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 much lower than the near-Earth asteroids that are in our neighborhood and continually flying by the Earth on a regular basis. Yeah. Mark, did you want to say something about comets? Sorry, Scott. Well, I just wanted to point out, uh, so Oumuamua was an interstellar object that came in very fast, uh, but long period comets also come in very fast and they vastly outnumber interstellar objects, but in turn, they're vastly outnumbered by um, asteroids uh, that, as Ed said, go around and around and we have many chances to see those. But I think, um, we really do need to have some concern for comets because we really don't have a lot of time to deal with a comet. Um, if we discover a comet on a collision course, a long period of uh, comet, um, there really isn't a lot we can do. Um, so we really, uh, at some point, have to accept the fact that we can't make the risk go to zero. There, if, if there's an object that's determined to hit us and doesn't give us much warning, there's really nothing we can do. Um, so we, we should be concerned with um, things that we can deal with. And those are asteroids, mostly. OK, thank you. So uh, OK, so we have had quite a few questions about uh, extracting resources from uh, asteroids, obviously asteroid mining. We've had somebody asking about helium-3, so I think Ian has volunteered to address this. Well, I'm not sure if I can, I'm the right person to talk about helium-3, but for sure uh, I can say that I believe uh, asteroid mining to some in, the, what, in different ways uh, you can interpret that is the future of human exploration in deep space. So for sure, there's a lot going on at the moment in private industries and space agencies trying to figure out how we can extract resources. I personally believe that uh, the most meaningful way would be to try to produce propellants uh, to, to push us uh, further, uh, deeper in the, uh, in the exploration of the solar system. Now there are uh, of course, a lot of technological hurdles. Uh, uh, if some of you have uh, followed the Rosetta mission, uh, you might have seen how hard it is to uh, anchor uh, to a small body, such a comet in that case, or even an asteroid. Um, think about uh, a gravity where you just, uh, just by touching the ground, you would uh, jump and... Uh, yourself uh, and eject yourself from from uh, from that surface so anchoring is extremely complicated navigating a spacecraft around such a small body is extremely complicated and once you have figured that out uh, you still have to uh, to dig or extract resources and process them so all of these are really fascinating uh, technological challenges that uh, i encourage young generations and students, engineers uh, to get into because that's really uh, uh, the best way we, we have today to, um, to envisage uh, human presence uh, in different places than our uh, 
uh, Earth Moon system. Okay, thank you, Ian. Uh, so I've looked through the questions, and the last one I, I can see here, um, unless Greg has any more, is from John Goodry, who is asking about the Tesla Roadster. Is it being tracked like an asteroid? And I think I can actually answer that and say. While the Tesla Roadster moves like an asteroid, like anything in deep space, it is not technically classified as an asteroid and has a different type of designation. Uh, it is interesting, however, to look back and realize there was one near-Earth object which was found and initially classified as an asteroid. And upon inspection, it was discovered that the colors, the spectra, looked like black and white paint that was used for the Saturn Vs. And it was, in fact, it is, in fact, believed to be the upper stage of a Saturn V that was used during the Apollo program. So the Tesla Roadster, yes, will continue through deep space for a long time, but it probably won't wear as well as many of the asteroids. Uh, it's also interesting to note that while it went off into, onto this orbit, of course, astronomers being astronomers did their best to science the heck out of this object. And they got light curves discover, observing its rotation rate and changes on, on its rotation rate. So yeah, if you launch a spacecraft, expect to be scienced like, uh, by, by the astronomers that are interested in these things. So yeah, um, Greg, if there's nothing else, how are we, uh, what else are we gonna I, do I, here? Well, there are actually, there, is, there are hundreds of questions here I'm sorting like, through. Bring them forth. Uh, you... Well, you know, uh, there's one, if a Chelyabinsk-sized object survives re-entry to hit the ground largely intact, what differences would be expected in terms of damage? And this question comes from Delta Zulu. Okay, who, who believes to be they are the expert on this? I would believe the first thing would be a bigger hole in the ground. Oh, Mark I think is Mark, waving. Mark. Um, I can say something about that. Am I on? <laughs> um, so um, the, the Chelyabinsk object was a stony asteroid and it wasn't strong enough to make it to the ground, but something of the same size, uh, the same mass, if it had been made of iron, it almost certainly would have made it to the ground. And that has happened before. Um, and it would have made a crater. It would have made a crater uh, very much like uh, Meteor Crater, Arizona, somewhat smaller. Me the Meteor Crater uh, object was more massive by maybe a, a factor of 10 or so. Um, but it would have hit the ground, caused an explosion, um, caused a very strong air blast. Uh, but in fact, once you, once you get away from that crater, um, the blast wave would have died off. So it, may, it would have done more intense damage locally. In fact, complete and utter devastation uh, around a very small area. But away from that area not as much damage as actually happened in Chelyabinsk. There, it turns out that there is what uh, we call an optimal height of burst. Optimal not meaning a good thing, optimal in this case meaning a very bad thing. For a given sized explosion, there is an altitude that does the most damage. And the surface is not that altitude. Um, the Chelyabinsk explosion was above that altitude. Um, a couple kilometers above the surface, if the explosion had happened there instead of where it did or, or at the surface, that's where the maximum damage over the largest area would have been. So back to you. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. Greg, I'm seeing one here about uh, from Miss Demina. Many sure. benefits of capturing NEAs, tethers for elevators, radiation shield. Rosetta showed that these missions can take many years. Will we preempt this and park asteroids in preparation for use? Or will we reactivate a late mission? I think, um, yes, the thing is, you don't want to go, you don't want to get put the cart before the horse. Asteroid, uh, asteroid prevention, whatever, asteroid uh, hazard mitigation is largely about discovery ahead of time, right? It's, you don't want to build your big infrastructure to do deflect these when you could uh, spend a lot less money and discover these. Anybody raise their hand if you want to answer it? <laughs> yeah, people not getting the question here, yeah. 
Well, I've got uh, I've got one uh, that that's quite nice here um, from Juan. Uh, is the Bannu mission timeline still holding as planned? Anyone want to talk about Bennu for a moment? The Osiris Rex. <laughs> exactly. I mean, lo logically, it has to be on time because they've you know, organized their launch windows with uh, very strict precision. So if it's not on time, then things are going very wrong. So I believe that it's doing just fine. And they sent out a lot of wonderful Valentine's Day cards for the the Bennu mission uh, as Osiris Rex. Here there is one. Um, what other candidates um, are considered for testing after kinetic impact from Hendon? I think Ian might be. Yeah. Is what other candidates? Uh, yes, it says what candidates, but maybe yeah, maybe well, talk. Let's say um, we've studied kinetic impactor since a long time, and we all agree that um, sizes in the range from 80 to uh, 500 meters are the ones uh, where we would uh, like to test a kinetic impactor. And that's the, um, and the reason why is that um, that's where we believe we can have um, uh, a, a, an effect on the orbital dynamic of the asteroid that we can measure quite accurately. Uh, if you go for much larger asteroids, um, the change in orbital parameter is so little that it's very, very difficult to measure, uh, if measurable at all. As a matter of fact, the kinetic impactor is considered to be efficient in these ranges of asteroids, so below the kilometer size or uh, at the kilometer at the maximum. So that's the type of uh, that's the type of size. In terms of uh, in terms of composition, uh, we are actually interested in all kinds of composition because uh, what we do today is laboratory tests where we do hypervelocity impacts on small uh, pieces of rock and we vary uh, the the, the so-called porosity of these rocks. But uh, uh, extracting the results of laboratory tests. Uh, at the, let's say meter scale type of object to 100 meters, it's uh, challenging to say the least. So ideally, we would want to test the kinetic impactor on different types of uh, composition and internal structure. Back to you, Scott. Okay, thank you, Ian. So we have a question. I think Ed will be the best one to answer this. So Space TV on net.net on Twitter is asking, if a network of satellites or spacecraft were built to look for asteroids that could threaten the Earth, what would be the best location in our solar system for those satellites? Well, if you're going to put a bunch of spacecraft up there as opposed to a single large one, and you're concerned mostly with the ones that are going to come near the Earth, which are the ones we, we care about for two reasons. One's, those are the ones where we can send scientific missions to. Um, those are also the ones that come near Earth are the ones that you uh, might perhaps uh, mine for resources. And lastly, those are the ones that are most likely to hit the Earth. So that means you actually want to keep the orbits of your spacecraft fairly similar to the Earth's orbit. So you want them to be probably, you want them likely to be slightly inside Earth's orbit uh, so that they can look in the anti-sun direction for them, not look, not staring into the sun, staring away from the sun. But you want to be fairly close to Earth's orbit in distance, in terms of distance away from the sun. Okay, so I think we're getting on for one hour into this stream, and I think unless there's any really great questions out there, we should probably uh, <laughs> get back to. There's, there's many great Sorry? questions. <laughs> There's many great <laughs> questions, but I think, uh, well, I think, it, I think we can go on forever. So, um, you know, maybe you want to send the questions to info at asteroidday.org and, and keep uh, putting them on, on, on social media and we can just answer them after. That would be great. So remember the hashtag asteroid day 2018 and you can send them to info at asteroidday.org and we'll, we'll address these, I guess. So, um, yeah, uh, Greg, we were all ready to round out. We've got to say thanks to all our guests. Absolutely. Yeah, this has been a, an interesting kickoff, and uh, we hope we will have actually an amazing Asteroid Day later this year, June 30th. Remember, to, you can 
participate by signing the 100x declaration. You can participate by organizing your own event. And once again, thanks to everybody that has joined me on the stream, Ed, Danica, Rudiger, Ian, Mark, Debbie, and uh, Tom, and of course, Greg. Thank you very much. Thank you. That. Goodbye. Thank you. Farewell. Good. Fly safe.